they're officially on the verge of one of those little waves. Two on the board, chance to get another one today too. Definitely. Was it a little bit slow in your opinion leading up to this week with only having sellers committed prior to uh, row committing the other day? Was that a little bit behind the behind schedule, you would say? Uh, it was behind the schedule from last year, but but actually not by uh, I, Chris. I think you looked it up, man. It was not as much off as I actually sort of uh, felt like it was. Yes, yeah, yeah. Looking back, and y- you knew you were always kind of one one little stretch away from from being right back, kind of on track with the numbers. And, and obviously, there is a there's a welcome home out there for South Carolina. So I, I think for for them. You're probably right back on pace at this point, and you know we we should learn something here pretty soon. I would think on that one, and so I, I think for for Carolina now, it's just about maybe add another guy or two, but but really you get into kind of those June official visit weekends, and you know they've even got an official visitor for the spring game actually, mm-hmm. and so uh, you know you got David Sanders coming in. That's a guy that's going to be a a big just. Big boy recruiting battle, you call it. And you got Ryan Montgomery, who is probably going to decide fairly soon. And then you've got upwards of like 30 official visitors from June alone. And, and so at that point, it's about how many of those guys can you close, basically. When you look at – I did look it up again to make sure, Wes. So last year's cycle, the 2020 – Four cycle. If you look back at how South Carolina was pacing around this time, um, Josiah Thompson committed April 14th. So April 14th, 2023, it's April 12th, 2024 now. He was the seventh verbal commitment then. Um, Kelvin Hunter would follow a few days later. That gave him eight. And I think they took, they kept, they had eight commitments going out of the month of April. And then they would add a few more in. Now, obviously, it wasn't a huge high school class because it was once again a pretty big portal class for South Carolina. They got some more guys to jump in, uh, whether it was over the summer or even a little bit later, you look like DeBron Gatling. He was a guy that didn't jump on until, you know, signing day in December. So they they did a lot of work early as far as either laying the groundwork or getting some early commitments. But if you look at it now, if South Carolina picks up a commitment, say, today, and uh, that would give them four, and you had about seven at the, you had seven at this time last year. So it's not like you're miles away from where you were. Now, now the 2024 class was kind of unique. You had some guys in that class that had been recruited for so long um, made early, you had, you know, a Dante Reno, you had Cam Pringle, you had Josiah, even Josiah didn't commit, you know, until April 14th. So, um, I think we all expected at some point there would be a little wave and that's kind of where we're at now. So we didn't get a chance to dive into this yesterday, but one of the welcome homes from earlier on this week did end up being Demarcus Leach, a three-star safety from up the road in Abbeville. And one thing that sticks out to me about, uh, this guy size six foot three, 185 pounds playing safety. Yeah, that, that's kind of prototypical size. I think if you look at the guys Torian Gray has recruited at that position, it, it does seem like size matters. And, you know, you got some length. Uh, obviously, Nicky Mawari, a, a big, tall, lengthy guy. Um, Kilgore, who has ended up playing, obviously, a lot of nickel for them this past season. But, uh, you know, it was kind of a safety coming in. He's 6'2", 6'3", has some length to him. And, and so I, I think for them that that's a – a priority you can see why they like leech and this is in my opinion your classic in-state smaller town now now abbeville very proud program like this program has been really really good over the years um going back decades really but in, in terms of population compared to you know some of the other places you could recruit definitely you're kind of a little bit under the radar palmetto state three-star guy that you just want to develop when, when you get him in. And I, I think there are some things to like. May, maybe a little position versatility, you know, depending on how he develops athletically. But for the most part, I, I think he is a true safety type. I think that's where he plays. Um, pretty good hips, pretty fluid in his back pedal, has decent speed, and is someone that they offered first in camp last year. And – it, it doesn't seem like Virginia Tech is always in on these guys as well. No matter no matter who the coaching staff, you know, this has been throughout multiple coaching staffs. That program 
has always done a pretty good job of getting in here. No surprise that they were second to offer. Pro- they were probably kicking themselves. I imagine as quickly as that offer came after South Carolina offered, probably one of those situations where he was on their board and they were waiting and, and probably were going to be first. Then the kid camps at South Carolina, has a good showing. South Carolina goes ahead and offers. And I, I think he was one of those in-state guys that unless, you know, like – an Alabama or something <laughs> popped in, it, it was always going to be tough for – once South Carolina offered first, started developing the relationship, I think it was always going to be kind of tough for anybody else to beat them out in this case. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and, and I think you, you look at the way this recruitment unfolded, um, I, I'm honestly just stealing your point, Wes, like a Satorian Gray special, right? That, didn't you coin that? Um, because, you know, Torian Gray has – a unique process when it comes to DBs. He's going to get you in on some some big names, you know. Uh, Jalewis Solomon. I mean, it, th- there's going to be some big name type of guys that he gets you in on, but he's also going to, you know, mine the kind of diamond in the rough type of guys, and that includes in-state guys. I mean, we we all know the story about Nicky Minori coming to camp and, you know, didn't have a whole bunch of offers, but Clayton White and Tory and Gray really liked him. They end up offering DQ Smith, a guy who – had not played uh, defensive back literally since the eighth grade, was a high school quarterback. And Torian Gray goes and, and watches him in a game, and he's running people over playing quarterback. And he goes, I like how tough this guy is, and I think his skill set will translate. And, you know, it has. He's shown the capability to play. So Demarcus Leach, for me, does play DB. <laughs> he, he has played it throughout high school. But he's um, he is an interesting prospect that I think Gray's also shown – the ability to mold guys that maybe, you know, need some molding when they get to, to the college level, frankly. And Leach is, is a guy that has a lot of those physical tools that he can mold. Well, I, I like that he also does play some quarterback and not a guy that's going to be making that transition from quarterback to, to safety. Like you said, he's already playing there, but they moved him over, I, I believe, mid-year or at some point going into his junior year. It was one of those, let's get our athlete, let's get our best athlete the football and kind of just said, look, let's just make the move and, and moved him to quarterback. And I think especially now when we're when talking about a guy who's only playing quarterback, sometimes you get the, well, I don't want to really want to move to another position. That's another thing completely. But when you have a guy who's already playing another position or is like DQ Smith fully willing to make that transition, I think there's a lot of added value from a guy who has played the quarterback position just because they have to know what's going on everywhere on the field. There's an understanding of, hey, I'm I'm in a cover three concept here. Maybe if I just play safety, I just know, wait, this is where I'm supposed to be based on what I'm seeing. If you have to also play quarterback, you have an understanding of what the other team is trying to do against that defense as well. So I, I think there's a deeper more holistic understanding of the game and the concepts in front of you by playing some reps at quarterback. And so to me, I think that's some value here as well. And this is, it's an in-state guy from a, like I said, a, a great program. I think you just, you don't pass on guys like this. Um, he, he's going to give you something, even if it's just special teams, but you hope he comes in and develops and uh, ultimately is a starter. The, the thing that I'm interested in, in with Leach is, you know, he does play at Abbeville, like you mentioned, which, man, he said he had a great quote to me when I was interviewing him after he committed. And I basically asked him, hey, what are what are your strengths on the field? And he went through some things. But one of the last things he said that really caught my attention was, you know, I'm, I'm from Abbeville, so we're tough. I mean, we're going to we're going to give it our all. And, and when you, it got me thinking, like, you're, you're right. You know, that's the team that's won. Yeah, they play what two a ball, but they win all the time. Uh, they've got a bunch of state championships in their trophy. And when you think of Abbeville football, you think of a bunch of tough, hard-nosed guys. Now, what you know, with that comes, is he fully developed in terms of coverage abilities and things like that? Not as much, but he's going and playing a lot of seven-on-seven on seven ball, you know, this spring, this summer, against some high-level receivers. So I think that's going to help him. I actually talked to his DB trainer, who's Kevin Washington. And Kevin um, also trains Marcellus Dial, who's played at South Carolina, is about to get drafted here in the NFL draft this month. And he said, hey, not in a bad way, but still got some rawness, which is exciting. 
and mentioned, you know, the arm length and how he can he can jump, and he's starting to see him continually progress on the seven-on-seven seven circuit. So a lot, a lot to work with here in terms of the physical tools with DeMarcus Leach. So now we've got three guys committed for 2025. Again, waiting to see what that other welcome home is going to be. Two guys on offense, the wide receiver spot, now one DB. What air, what side of the ball is going to have a little bit more emphasis in this class? You just mean overall? Yeah, just overall. I, I think you want it to be balanced, as always, honestly. I mean, if I'm the staff... I want a quarterback in every class. I want a running back or two in every class. I want, uh, you know, I, I would say numbers-wise, maybe a few more receivers than than a typical class. But for the most part, to me, this will be another balanced class if if they have their way. Now, now the difference is these days you don't extend out. Like, you, you don't take a risk on guys you're not sure about anymore because – you just go to the portal most of the time to, to fill that need. So it, it is a little bit different. We'll see what the overall numbers look like. But I would imagine probably another fairly balanced class for South Carolina. We'll continue to see how that trends, see what that other welcome home is going to be whenever it comes out. Also have plenty of coach sound today as a Coach Elliott and Coach DeCamillis did speak to the media. You guys going to continue to steer the ship here. i got to get over to TEC Equipment Rentals to uh, host halftime show so uh, you guys can take it from here. Just we'll don't try drive to, off into the ditch. Yeah, we'll <laughs> try to keep it uh, keep it in between the lines, right? All right, it is the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour presented by Firehouse Subs on your Friday here on the game. Tell you about one of our great partners here on the Gamecock Central Takeover Hour on the game. We tell you about them every day, and that is Integrated Media. My guy Michael, my guy Nathan, and their entire team can help take your home or your business to the next level from an audiovisual standpoint. But they do even more than that. Yes, you think of audiovisual, you think of a man cave, you think of home theater. You think of a TV installation and all that good stuff. Yeah, they can do that. They can do it inside for you. They can do it outside on your patio or outdoor area. But they can also do much more. They can do a complete security system with cameras for you. And they can link all of your audiovisual stuff and your security and cameras up to your smartphone. Yeah, they can give you a complete smart home system. Get more info, 803-948-8327 or Integrated Media Inc., Dot com. Check out what Michael, Nathan, and their team at Integrated Media can do for you.
that thing? All right, welcome back in. Gamecock Central Takeover Hour, Wes Mitchell. Chris Clark, every now and then, Chris, they just give us the controls. We're here. We're going to try to keep this thing in between the lines. By the way, reminding you, so I've, I've noticed Tyler does this, so I'm just going to do what Tyler does. Go to 1075thegame.com, register the Palmetto Citizens FCU Grand Slam giveaway. Every game, $25 is added to the pot. If a Gamecocks hitter rips a Grand Slam homer, <laughs> You, Chris Clark, can win all the cash in the pot right now. The pot, $825. I actually don't think I can win. No, you can't. But somebody else can. Up. Somebody else could. 1075thegame.com. Oh, FCU is Federal Credit Union, by the way. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Palmetto Citizens Federal Credit Union. See, Ron Burgundy, like, you, you got to <laughs> just spell it out here for me, guys. But I feel like Bill Gunner. <laughs> oh, Wow. Shots Man. fired. We were doing so well too. We had we had the music coming in. You had the read. We're we're still we're still, we're still on track. We're still we're good. good. We're, we're still good. good. We're good. Yeah. Hope y'all are good as well. Friday, beautiful Friday in the capital city. And Chris, let's keep talking recruiting since we can talk about whatever we want to talk about. And potentially another addition to the class later today. Sumter's Anthony Addison set to commit between noon and one. And this is someone I think again. South Carolina has been in a good spot with ever since they offered. They offered him the day of the South Carolina Clemson game as an in-person offer. I think it. I think it meant a lot to him to have that kind of moment with his family around and, and to receive word right down the road at Sumter High School. That's a school the Gamecocks of South Carolina have done very well at. And you know, I, I think if this one goes the way that we assume and think that it will later today it's another i would say solid in-state pickup for the gamecocks it is you know it shane beamer said and, and all coaches i think say this to a degree when they first come into a new place say we've got to take care of the state of south carolina right and make sure that we're doing well in state and so you know beamer's first class kind of a i mean a wash for almost anybody right you, you're got a during COVID, you got a brand new staff. You can't even have guys on campus, and and such a short timeline, really, given that there was an early signing period. 2022, you didn't have a lot of time, but you know, 2023, 2024, you started seeing some of the fruits of the labor in state, especially like on the offensive line. Wes, you land three guys that Clemson all wanted too, by the way, plus out of state schools, and you're able to go get them. There have been some misses sprinkled in here and there. You know, Amari Adams from South Florence right now committed to Clemson. But you look at some of the momentum they've got with some guys, a few of them are in-state. You know, you got Jaden Sellers in the class. you got Demarcus Leach, who we just talked about, and Addison's another that they have an offer out to and, and have prioritized. You know, we, we saw this guy uh, at South Carolina's camp last summer and very interesting player because you, you get out there and you go, all right, this isn't, so isn't the biggest guy in terms of he's not a – he didn't look like Dylan Stewart. You know, he's not 6'5", 240, 250. He's listed at 215 pounds, which, you know, seems pretty close to, to me. Uh, but you watch him out there moving around, going against, you know, Cam Pringle at times last summer. And he, he's got the look of a guy who can really move. He flashed some pass rush ability. Working with Sterling Lucas, who got a good look at him. So, interesting prospect, I think. Yeah, he, he's an explosive kid is the thing that I noticed on film. Um, pretty good first step. And he, he actually, for, for kind of a, a long, lengthy pass rusher, which is what you're looking for, I think he changes direction well in the backfield, which is obviously important when you talk about you have that initial burst. But this stuff that Sterling Lucas was talking about with one of his guys – the other day, I think it was maybe Kyle Kennard, how he was in position to get several more sacks than he did last year for, for Georgia Tech. And it was like, can you make a, a slight adjustment in order to do that? And Sterling Lucas was talking about kind of how every guy every guy comes in and you're kind of looking, what what's the most important thing we can improve about your game that can put you in a position to improve overall. And so with, with Anthony Addison, I, I just like that 
he, he's not just a straight line guy. After he gets that initial burst and gets into the backfield, tends to do a pretty good job of changing direction and closing out the play, whether that's uh, for a sack or to hit a running back in the backfield. So uh, I think there, there's some acceleration. There's some speed here. He's a high three-star guy right now, which I, I think is fair. Can, can he fill out that frame is probably – your biggest question and probably the thing that is keeping him from being quite that four-star guy right now because, you know, he is 6'4", 6'3", 215. So can he get to that SEC edge size is probably something that at this exact moment means high three-star to me Mm -hmm. is probably pretty fair for, for what he is as a prospect. But as always, that's something that is kind of a, a fluid moving process. Yeah, it, this is this is the type of guy that maybe it takes, you know, a little bit longer to develop because he is going to need to put on weight and and add strength. He's not as much of a, you know, Dylan Stewart. Like the expectations are a little bit different because you know, obviously, we're, he's one of the most talented freshmen in the country. Regardless, when you look at the ranking, the schools that were after him, but also from a size standpoint, and many people have said some version of this. He he just kind of. He checks all those boxes. He looks like you would want to draw him up. Addison's someone that, yeah, I mean, from from what he looks like at Sumter High until what he is going to look like, what he needs to look like at South Carolina, there's a little bit more of a process there to get him there. And and he's not probably ever going to be a 260-pound player. That'd be pretty surprising if that ever ended up happening. But I think, Wes, what you don't want is to look back in a few years and Anthony Addison's playing for Duke or Tennessee or, you know, he, he guys even get out of state and go to App State and things like that, and you're going, that guy could really help us, you know, and then you didn't prioritize him. Um, Addison's a guy that when you look at the physical tools and the upside and the things he can do and help you with, I think it makes a lot of sense to be someone to prioritize for South Carolina. And I, I'll go ahead and get ahead of this one. So for, for those who don't know how the on three industry ranking works, <laughs> he there's going to be inevitably some people that see us guy was a four star the other day. And then they're going to see he committed to South Carolina today, potentially later on today and be like, why is he a three star? So the on three industry ranking is an average of, on three's ranking, 24-7 sports ranking, rivals ranking, and ESPN. It is a weighted average. And so at some point, for whatever reason, the 24-7 sports ranking was not in there. It is in there now. And he's a high three-star and not a four-star. So, so he, was, he was not moved down. So you didn't move him down. No one moved him down. I'm just getting out in but front the, of that, the, too. The 24-7 yeah. sports rating is lower than... Than the on yes. three rating. And, and then, so when yes. it got popped in there. So West didn't move him down. On three didn't move him down. And nobody moved him down. And but it's 24 7 sports fault, is what Chris is saying. <laughs> I'm, I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I, did, I didn't say that either. We're, we're, dimin- we're just destroying all the narratives around it. It also did not happen just today in terms of nobody ranked him today. Yes. So but his rating overall please, did move down today. Like please, you're not imagining things. We're right. Not, but it's just because we're not of gaslighting an you. But. It was because the 24-7 rating was not plugged into the on three industry ranking. There's definitely going to be somebody on Twitter, if he commits to South Carolina, who goes on and says, look at this. They're going to have a side-by-side. Oh, and, he and, moved down. <laughs> and people are going to believe it because in some way it is tr- it's going to look like it's true yeah. because his, his ranking on the on three industry ranking did move down. If you looked at it yesterday and looked at it today, it's going to look different. But that is that is full transparency, the reason okay. why. I literally saw I saw the profile as it got refreshed, basically. We believe you. And, I do. Well, some people might not, Chris. But it was better because I I, I'm the one who noticed it. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> this, oh, is, no. this is going to be bad. But – it was better for it to go ahead and happen as opposed to him commit as a four star and then it be like, oh, now he's not like a couple yeah, of days exactly, later. Exactly. Right? Yeah, I agree. 
So much better. Anyway, that that would be potentially. So that let, let's say you know he commits that that would be four public commits, and so you said at the end of April last year they were at eight. Yeah, I think they had eight because Josiah Thompson was on April fourteenth, a couple of days away. And then April 19th was Kelvin Hunter, and I think that was the last one that they got kind of in those spring months. Then you're, you know, June, they got a couple more, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, still a little bit a little off bit of that pace, but depending on how the re- – I mean, it's April 12th. Depending on how the rest of this month goes, it, it could – they could end up being right on or right below that number, I, I think. And some of that will depend on do they get Ryan Montgomery. Does he, does he truly uh, commit – here soon uh, you know that commitment could be april may and that's obviously always a big thing can you check off your quarterback spot for a class and i'll I'll have to go through this list too wes and compare it to last year but man do you feel like there's more official visits scheduled you know just there's definitely more scheduled at this point at this point yeah Yeah. now that they ended up having some big weekends they did 10 11 12 guys it felt like i think but yeah, in terms of the time in which these guys went ahead and started setting OVs, very, very early in the process, I feel like. So, anyway, all right, yeah, if, if South Carolina lands Addison, we'll, of course, talk about him more on Monday. When we come back, we're going to dive into what Coach Joe D and Sean Elliott had to say about the progress of their units here in spring practice. Be right back. Gamecock Central Takeover Hour. Got another cool thing you can register for. It's a sub at Firehouse Subs. You should go to their website at firehousesubs.com or download the app. That, of course, is the Firehouse Subs app. Just go to your app store, Google Play, whatever you use on your mobile device, and you can check out their incredible array of subs. Lunch, dinner, catering, whatever your needs are, whether it's for you, for you and your significant other, your whole family, or a party that you're going to, Firehouse Subs has you covered. You can avoid the wait and order online by using the Rapid Rescue to go. And while you're at it, let me recommend, it's, it is lunchtime, go check out, limited time only, the Barbecue Cuban Sub. It is Southern Roots with the Cuban Twist. I just had it this week, and let me tell you, it is pretty outstanding. Go get it at firehousesubs.com, or again, the Firehouse Subs app. 14 convenient locations around the Midlands. Find the one closest to you, and use the Rapid Rescue to avoid the wait and order online, firehousesubs.com.
All right, welcome back in. West Mitchell here, Chris Clark. Like I said, Coach John Elliott, Coach Joe DeCamillis talking to the media yesterday about, of course, Gamecocks tight ends. A little bit of run game talk from Coach Elliott as well and special teams talk from Joe D, as you would expect. Chris, we, we got some, I would say these, these have been under the radar position battles on the special team side. Maybe we, we've missed talking about them for, for whatever reason. So I want to get to that here in a second. But I also thought there were some really interesting read between the line things to take from what Elliot said. And uh, if we want to queue up cut two here, Dave, I, I got a feeling that we're going to see these tight ends a little bit more involved in the running game this year. And I also think just being able to to be steady, consistent blockers appears to be a, a priority for South Carolina this offseason for this group. I mean, it makes sense. You have a guy who built his reputation as an O-line coach. You bring him in. He's coaching the tight ends now. And, you know, he, he talked about even when he got hired, hey, I'll lean on some of the other guys when it comes to coaching these guys as far as passing game concepts. But – this, this is someone from the moment you've known Sean Elliott, you knew physicality yep. was going to be important. Physicality is a requirement. And I, I thought he had some some really good stuff to say yesterday about the tight end's involvement in the running game. Well, you know, just from my standpoint, anybody that I coach, I want to be fighters. I want to be tough uh, with no back down. And uh, what we've done in that room this this spring and just to, what are we going to practice, 11 maybe? What is it? I'm not sure. 10 or 11? Uh, I'm not, I don't even know. Uh, they have gotten more physical. And uh, when you think of the physical nature, that can be on the perimeter and blocking for screens. That could be um, lining up inside in a split flow zone concept, backside kicking out a big defensive end that's crashing down. Uh, uh, I try to tell these guys they got to put their face in the fan each and every rep. And uh, to kind of describe that, that's kind of taking the fan right there and just letting it just blister you, you know. And, and that's the mentality I want these guys to have. I want them to play with no fear, uh, a face in the fan mentality where they're no back down. They understand what's coming at them. It's going to be tough. It's going to be physical. But uh, that's what they live for. Um, I, I was in the meeting yesterday, and uh, we had a little shoulder bruise because uh, we did a great job on a split flow cut block uh, coming down the line. And he was like, yeah, my shoulder is sore. I was like, well, God, that's what football's based upon, you know? I was like, you shouldn't even play the game if you're not. We know what we're getting into. We're getting, we're getting into this to be physical. We're going to have bumps. We're going to have bruises. We're going to be sore. We're going to ache. We're going to hurt. And you got to play through all that. Uh, but you got to be fearless. And I said, listen. My shoulder hurts, but I'm going to go out there and do it, and they're going to do it. And we've done a good job, I think, in establishing more of a physical mentality in that room. That, of course, Sean Elliott. And Chris, first of all, Chris, you you cannot tell me <laughs> this guy doesn't wake up every single morning ready to sprint to work. Like, I know every coach said, you know, I'm at my dream job. I'm, you know, I'm excited to be here, blah, blah, blah. You know, all the press conference quotes that you got to get in and check the boxes on. But when I listen to Sean Elliott talk, I I firmly believe it, that there, there might literally, uh, you know, other than maybe spending time with his family and his kids, stuff like that, as far as work goes, there is nothing this dude yeah. would rather be doing than coaching ball. He's getting to do it at a school he grew up pulling for he's getting to do it you know what 20 miles from uh maybe less from where he grew up and i, I mean the, just the level of excitement and passion that he has is uh palpable i i feel like but he, he's gonna get something new i feel like out of these tight ends when it comes to physicality but really and we'll maybe get into what he had to say about some of the guys specifically but I think he has guys, Chris, that will respond to that and probably have responded to that in Josh Simon and Brady Hunt. He had some really positive things to say about both guys. And we saw Josh Simon last year, even in some run-after-the-catch situations, talk about putting your face in the fan. This dude is not scared to put his face in the fan. So I think it's a good, it's a good match when you look at Elliott style and these tight ends. Yeah, he, he's got a bunch of guys that have interesting backgrounds. You know, Josh Simon, also from the state of South Carolina, country guy, 
tougher guy, right? You know, I call him to talk about his commitment, and he's out hunting, you know, things like that. And um, He's out hunting. Hunting, Chris. yeah, excuse me. Yeah, I don't know why I added the G to it. I'm from Belton, too. They'd be, yeah, you are. They'd be, <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> you know, you've got Brady Hunt, who came from a smaller school. Con- Connor Cox, West. I mean, we heard he, he ended up playing more than most people thought last season as a true freshman. So you've got some guys that have some toughness. I think you've got some guys that didn't come in as big time recruits, so they're they're hungry, you know. And it was interesting to hear him say that they've already gotten tougher, right? If you, man, it, not to say they weren't tough before, but that's one thing that Sean Elliott's going to do to a group. He's going to have an impact on guys in terms of their mentality, how they approach things, their toughness. He's going to take them from point A to point B in that regard. At a minimum, I think we we've seen that from him. Uh, in the past. Well, I think if if you're playing for him, you, you're not going to play for him, basically, if you don't do those things. You know what yeah. I'm saying? It's going to be next man up yeah. if, if you don't do those things that, that he's requiring of you at that position. And, and it did maybe bring to the surface another thought for me, man. I You know I write the injury report each Tuesday on, on Gamecock Central, and I, I'm not saying that there aren't certain situations where – uh, this is more of a broad thought uh, across college football. Naturally, when there are injuries, people start to talk about strength, conditioning, nutrition, all those things. Are, are the guys prepared? And um, th- that obviously is something you have to look at if you have a lot of injuries, if you are a coaching staff, right? Let, let's look at early in the Will Muschamp era when when there were so many what they call soft tissue issues. Mm-hmm. And you're saying, all right, are, are you guys drinking enough water? Like, are you hydrating? Are you stretching enough? So, yes, those things do factor into injuries. But I, I thought it was an interesting – it was a, an unrelated comment, but it, to me, is related, just not purposely. These are big, strong athletes who, on a play-to-play basis, are slamming into each other. <laughs> Every injury is not a strength, conditioning, nutrition issue. You're, if, you, if you play football, you're probably going to get a bump or a bruise pretty much every day. Mm-hmm. You're on, if you exit without hurting at some point, you probably didn't practice hard that day. So, I, again, I see the little like, responses, the comments every single time I put on an injury report. And this is not everybody by any means, but... There, there just seems to be this thing about injuries. And I, I just think it's important to point out, like, in, injuries are going to happen. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, you think about Case and Henry in the UNC game last year. He's coming off an injury that I, I honestly don't know how that injury happens, but he's, he's, he's got, you know, a, a road of, ahead that he had to, to go through. He gets himself healthy and back ready to go and play three or four of the game. He gets rolled up on. Football, you know, I mean, so, so there were it, it, they went through it this off season, Wes, looking back at, all right, man, we, we had a lot of injuries. Like when you think back to the theme of last season, that was one of them, tons of injuries. O-line injuries. They happened to be specific. concentrated, yes, on the O-line. And Shane Beamer told us, man, we, we looked at it. We left no stone unturned and we found out. And he said this actually, he, his quote was, this surprised me, but... We actually were had a similar number of injuries as the previous year. They just happened to be concentrated on O line, and so then then they looked at it and said, "Okay, is there something there?" Now we didn't get all the details. He didn't say, "All right, well, we changed this, this, this." Did they tweak some things? Just generally in the entire program, yes. But also a lot of those were just they were just football injuries, and and it's part of it, and they happen sometimes. Injuries do happen. Um, all right, guys, uh, when we come back, we're going to pay off that, uh, that Joe D tease. We're going to talk about the kicking battle and some kickoff returners and punt returners. This is Gamecock Central Takeover Hour. He's Chris. I'm Wes. We'll be right back.
All right, we're closing this thing out. Final segment of the week, Chris. I uh, hope everybody has a great weekend. Before we get out of here, we're going to talk a little Joe D. Man, th- this guy's one of my favorite coaches to listen to talk. And uh wasn't a long press conference, but it, it did have a little meat on the bone in terms of giving us an idea of what's going on with some of these position battles. And guess what? Gamecock's got to replace Mitch Jeter. And, you know, you remember going into what would have been – two seasons ago, I guess. Um, South Carolina, we, we didn't know who the kicker was going to be. And it, it went down to the wire. And then this guy, Mitch Jeter, he kind of, it almost felt like he got the first shot at being the guy. And he just decided, I'm never going to miss. And yeah. so then, then he, he becomes the dude for two years, has a really a great South Carolina career. He's at Notre Dame now, graduated, transferred, and now you, you do have a kicking battle that I feel like has not been talked about very much at all. And apparently there's been an injury involved in this kicking battle as well. So uh, let, let's go ahead. Let's hit that uh, cut 10 here from Jody there, Dave. Yeah, unfortunately with um, with Alex, he uh, he ended up getting a little bit of a heel injury right before we started. So uh, he's been limited uh, in quite a few practices early on. Uh, ended up hitting some balls today, which is good to see. Um, you know, so it's been it's been a little bit of a, a struggle for him so far. But the other guys, I'll tell you, uh, Joyce has done a good job for us. Some of the guys that have been here in the past, um, we've we've had a good competition so far there. So it's good to see. Yeah. So uh, he, he's obviously referring to Alex Herrera and Chris. That that's who Mitch Jeter very narrowly beat out for the kicking job. You know, two seasons ago, and it, it really th- there's a competition. Obviously, coming into this thing. It, it really, you would say, was Herrera's job to, to lose, I think. Yeah, I have, I have a two-part theory on the kicker thing. I think the first part of it is, you know, it's kicker. So it's it's very important, but in terms of, you know, what some folks pay attention to, it's not, you know, the quarterback battle or who's going to be the starting running back, things like that. It's not as, it's not as glamorous, although everybody recognizes its importance. And I think the second part of it is, a little bit spoiled around here in terms of kickers. Like you were just talking about Mitch Jeter. Like he he wins a closely contested battle, but then he just ah, he, he just kind of performs like one of the best kickers in the country after he does win the job. And so I think there's maybe a little bit of just, I don't know, an assumption that, hey, whoever they roll out there next will be just as good, right? Uh, we probably don't need to assume that, but they definitely have some guys, um, especially once Herrera can get – back fully in the fold west they've got some guys who were really good candidates i'm actually intrigued you know does mason love end up having to do something have something to do with this before it's all said and done you know you got kai kroger at punter i've heard mason love's been impressed he's got kicking and punting ability and i've heard some good returns on him so far in spring yeah and i I think uh, you know from what jody said they they don't want to put kicking on his plate right Mm -hmm. now but i i wonder and this is a philosophical thing for special teams coaches as well. Do do you potentially see Mason Love win the kickoff specialist yes. job? And so when when he came in, Mason Love was basically told like, "Hey, be ready. You, you may be doing some place kicking as well." And he had a really good season as a senior in high school at being a place kicker. And so for for him, that that's always going to be a possibility. Uh, I know they're kind of trying to limit that right now, and. The idea, though, I think of splitting up. I've always liked it when you could split up your place kicker and your kickoff specialist because it takes a little bit of that wear and tear off your kicker's leg throughout the course of an entire season, I think. Yeah, I mean, we saw Mitch Jeter do that, you know, um, before he took over as the actual place kicker. So, you know, Mason Love, man, you look back at him, uh, out of Missouri, 44 yards a punt. And then, you know, was their field goal kicker actually hit a long field goal of 57 yards at the high school level and then handled their kickoffs. Of course, he did everything at the high school level, level, 93% of his kickoffs were touchbacks. So, yeah, I think that will be kind of a potentially separate battle, Wes, of, okay, you've got, obviously, nobody's unseating Kai Kroger at punter, but you got field goal kicker, place kicker. I mean, do we even see a, like a long and short field goal kicker? I don't know if we've heard anything from Joe D on that, but there's there's some different things to consider here. And we've all seen games that have come down to Mr. Made field goals. So 
an important part of spring practice. And, and it's kind of interesting. Kicker is one of those things where, frankly, the, the fans don't know your name until you become the kicker Mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying a lot of times you got several walk-ons they're all competing for that top spot herrera already on scholarship and they they actually they they list william joyce as a punter on the official website and then uh, you also at what was that are we good Uh, testing one two, testing one two, one two three, one two three. Okay, well there's an there's an extra one in there. Well, I, I didn't know who's all. A lot of work there. Yeah, there's been a lot of guys. Um, you know, Vakari's been one of the guys that's been back there on punt return. Yeah, Gage has been t- back there on punt return. Testing one two, testing one two, um, testing one we've two. We've had uh, Kilgore back there on punt return. Those are all three right, guys. Kickoff return, all those same guys. Peyton mangren has been back there on kickoff return. So, right now the way we're running things is we really don't have a scout team. That makes sense. You know, when you get to the season, it's a scout team. What we've done is we break it up into four teams, um, and the whole spring, they're going to be working on each team, if that makes sense to you. So that means they're getting just as many work on, or just as much work on punt return, punt, kickoff, and kickoff return all the way through. And uh, it's just the way we've done it, and I think it's been good. I think it creates good competition, and they're running our ball. They're not worried about scout team looks and all that kind of stuff. They're running our ball, which I think is important, teaching-wise. Uh, yeah, Dr. Pepper's fine.